morning. Wow, did you feel that? That, uh, that line gets me every time. Fear can go to hell and shame can go there too because I know whose I am. God, I belong to you. Something, something stirs in us when we hear that. Like something just like, something stirs, and I know what that something is. That's just the voice of our creator. That's God saying, hey, do you believe that? Do you know that? Like fear and shame, these are not the melodies of heaven that God is singing over us, just the opposite. They come from a completely different place. This, today, I hope you're, I hope you're wearing socks. If you're not, it's okay. But I love what the Holy Spirit has done already. What an honor. I'm just excited to see what God is doing, and I love this series. All right, Genesis 3. Here we go. Um, a couple weeks ago, I got an opportunity to, um, to go up to Marshall, Texas to, to stay with my dad. I took a quick trip. My brother, Ron, his daughter, Sabrina, got married on beautiful Cattle Lake. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a great place. And got to just go and stay with my dad. You know, we talk about it at 930. We have this live stream community. And I'm not kidding. There were like 250 people that came together online that worship with us almost every week. And my father, my dad, is one of those live streamers. He watches every week from his little recliner right in front of what I love to say is the largest flat screen TV I have ever seen in my life. The resolution apparently so good, so high def that it is not uncommon after I'm done preaching and walk off the stage at 9.30, dad will text me and say, hey, it's time for you to get a haircut. Like that's how good <laughs> The clarity is on his phone, and I were on this TV, and I was, um, so I was staying with my dad that night, and have you ever just stayed at a different place, and I don't know if I was disoriented, I don't know what happened, but I know this happened. I was, I was getting ready for bed, and I, I went to the restroom, and as I came out of the restroom, I was turning the corner to go into the bedroom where I was sleeping, and I walked into a door. And the door wasn't closed. It's like the proximity from the bedroom to the bathroom is really, really close. So apparently when I came out of the bedroom, I just left the door like half open. So in the dark, I walk into the, just like the end of the door and I like smack it hard. I walk right, right here in the forehead. And when I say it shook the house, I'm not kidding, dogs started barking like next door. And you know, like your body gives you, I don't know, two or three seconds before all of a sudden, so you know the wave of hurt is about to come and forgive the vanity, but the first thing I thought was, how is my face? Because I'm like, that's high def right there. And this was Friday and I'm in front of Harvest on Sunday. Like how bad is it gonna be for these poor people to look at me? So I run in the, run in the bathroom, I flip on the light and two thoughts. Number one, I saw it was fine. Absolutely nothing. And I just said, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. But literally, as soon as I was thanking Jesus, it was almost like a Looney Tunes cartoon. This bump on my forehead, like a unicorn thing, just went, like, I, like you're blowing one of those balloons. Like I just watched this thing come out of my head and I thought, oh, what does this mean? So I do the responsible thing. I start searching what it means on the internet. And I go down this rabbit trail of this lady named Thelma. 15 years ago, she had one of those horns in her head. She still got it. It never went away. And I'm like, do I text my doctor? What do I do? This is going to be there forever. I have, well, clearly it's not so bad. You can still see it in the right light, but don't worry about that. But I wonder if, like, while I'm reading Genesis 3, part of me wonders, like, is that how... Adam and Eve felt on the other side of just walking into this moment and the fall. On the other side of a choice and a really bad decision, was this the defining moment on the forehead of humanity that we just said, oh man, this is just gonna mar us forever. Like what do you do with this story? What do you do with it? Like, what do you do with these questions? Like, why would God 
dangle a carrot in front of his creation? Why would God allow this moment? Like, why does evil exist? Why? We all have questions. And what I appreciate so much about this book and the way that this is based off of this series we're doing called Long Story Short about this author is I love that he actually addressed the questions because we as a people, we've got questions and greater, we want our answers, don't we? Like, I want to know, okay, God, why? Why was this, why did it go down the way that it did? And, and what does this mean for all of us today? And I mean, here's the real truth. We won't always have the answers. We don't have the answers. I don't have all of the answers. And when you go back to what I said last week, I mean, here you've got the story of Job. And this registered with so many of you because Job just said, wait a minute, I was righteous, it was upright, I followed you, God, and everything is upside down. Why? He's just asking God why. And I love that God gives Job plenty of time, 37 chapters to just vent, but finally when Job takes a breath, God speaks. And God's answer, it's probably not what he wanted, but it's like, look, you're not always gonna have the answers in the midst of all the stuff, yes, it's a broken place. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it seems like I'm distant. But here's a greater question for you, Job. Do you trust me? Do you, like, do you trust me? Do you trust that there are things that are happening that are bigger than you might even imagine, but I am still for you and I am not against you? So we may not, coming into this, you may not get all the answers that you want as to why. But here's the thing. <laughs> There's something about Genesis 3, there's something about this story today that even if we don't have all the answers, we get the situation because we know that this is, it's our story. I love what Joshua McNall said in chapter two. He said this, he said, for most of us, just like Adam and Eve, it doesn't take a, a booming voice from above to tell us that our choices haven't ended up the way that we had hoped. The first humans, they hid themselves before God ever came searching for them. And truth be told, we do the same. We hide behind fig leaves and long work days, behind the constant drone of a television or the glow of a smartphone. We fill our days with activity and our nights with distraction. And sometimes, sometimes we do it because we know as well as the first humans that our choices have damaged the relationships that matter most and we don't need a preacher or a prophet or a shrink to tell us that. We believe in the fall because we've experienced it. It's not just a part of God's story, it's a part of our story too. But here's, here's the way I really want to approach this one today, Genesis chapter three. The Lord really led me here and it's the right direction. What if we're looking at it from the wrong perspective? What if we're asking the wrong questions? Like what if it's not, why, why are things so bad for us? But instead, what if it's, how good is our heavenly father? Let's change the perspective this morning. Here's the way I would set it up. I love finding this this week. In Toronto, I read this news story. It's incredible. It's a story of this, this, this pothole that's in a neighborhood, and it has plagued this neighborhood for a long time. They've written petitions. The city's come. They've tried to fix it. No one could fix it. It actually reminded me, there's an insurance commercial right now, maybe you've seen it, where there's this pothole that has plagued people for like generations. It's just been an eyesore in the community. It's damaged all kinds of vehicles. Well, apparently, this is a real thing, and it's in Toronto. Hashtag, who knew? So they didn't know what to do. The community, the neighborhood, they were so frustrated by it. But one day, a motorist was driving by, and as they drove by, they started to see what they thought were weeds that were growing out of this pothole, but it wasn't weeds. Let me show you a picture. What it actually was, someone <laughs> under the cover of night, they don't know who, Someone with a wonderful sense of humor had actually brought in potting soil and tomato plants, and they planted tomatoes inside this pothole. Wait, it gets even better. All of a sudden, the neighborhood, the community, they got up in arms like, we can't let this go away. Next slide. So they form a neighborhood committee, and it has now turned into a community 
garden. <laughs> Come on. Like, I see that, and I'm like, oh, God, you are so good, because that is Genesis chapter 3. That is the story, even in the midst of, of brokenness and what could seem like a dark time. Let's reclaim the story, and let's find where God is painting and what God is doing and how God is showing off. This is rich, and it's beautiful. Three places I want to take you today. Number one, recognize the serpent. I can't just rush through this and not look at the snake for a moment. So recognize the serpent. Number two, claim the curse. What on earth does that mean? I'm so glad you just asked me that question. I'm gonna talk about that, claim the curse. And lastly, find the beauty in the covering that you find inside the story. I love this one. Will you join me in a word of prayer and let's dig a little bit deeper into this story. Gracious and loving God, I'm so thankful for who you are. Father, I'm thank you. I'm, th I'm so thankful just to see your movement, to see the Holy Spirit at work. So God, I pray now as we, as we open up this ancient text, as we go back and we look at this story that, Father, I've already seen you reclaim hearts and lives today where the enemy wanted people defined by shame and their failures. God, I've seen you just wrap them in the truth of who you are and what you're doing. And God, I pray for more Holy Spirit, I pray for more. Holy Spirit, I pray for an awakening. I pray for a revival. And I don't want it just to be inside this space. God, I love when we sing these songs and, and I love when we just break out into applause. But how sad if we leave you here, but God, stir something in your people so that we as a harvest could go into the very world to bring about the transformation, to remind people that there is still beauty in the fall. <laughs> it's a big prayer, but you are an even bigger God, so move. Holy Spirit, speak through me, if not through me, in spite of me, so that your will and your words can be heard, and may you be given all the glory, the honor, and the praise, and it's in your name that we say, amen. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter three, recognizing the snake. Now, if you remember where I was last week, how the whole message ended, we were in creation, and I have to start here because this is where the creation story ended in Genesis chapter two, verse 25, and the word says, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Remember, in the creation story, Genesis one and two, God, the creator, placed mankind in the garden. They dwelled in communion with the triune God, in communion with their heavenly father. They found their identity in that relationship. And even though they were naked, shame was not a part of the creation story. Now, if there's one thing, Genesis 2.25, shame, that was never intended to be a part of God's good and perfect creation, then wouldn't that be the very thing that the enemy would want to use as a device to cause a wedge between God and his creation. So just on the other side of, of being naked, feeling no shame, all of a sudden you move into the fall, Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? First question by the serpent is this. Did God really say all of a sudden, here we go. The serpent begins to mislead. The serpent begins to whisper. The serpent begins to cause humanity to question what they knew about their creator. What is it about snakes that surprise us? What is it about serpents that surprise us? There's a, a moment in this book, and I love it. It's so true. Like snakes, you just don't see them coming for the most part, right? Now, I know I'm looking out. I see your faces, and, and I know with a number of people here, there's a couple of you. I know this. And at the end of the day, you love to just hit the recliner to watch Funniest Home videos and to stretch that python around your neck and feed him and praise God for you. Love it. So excited for you. Don't send me pictures. Don't want to see it. <laughs> but 
for the most part, snakes make us a little uncomfortable because we just don't see them. I've walked up on snakes and I didn't know until I got really close to them. Look, if I'm just drinking cocoa on my porch later today and an alpaca comes down the street, I'm going to notice that. I'm going to see that coming. A cow, a dog, whatever. Snakes make us a little uncomfortable because you don't see them until you're right up on them. And that's how the serpent works. That's how the enemy, the deceiver, the liar, the adversary, that's how the snake works. He was there in Genesis chapter 3. And listen, don't be deceived, people of God. There is an adversary in our garden today, and he wants to deceive us. In fact, I think it's important to understand who it is that we are in a battle against. Forgive me. I'm not a big sports person. Who are the Saints playing today? Someone tell me. Who? The Rams? Wow, good for the Rams. I didn't know that. Okay. Saints are playing at 2 o'clock. You're going to get home in time. I'll get you to lunch. Everything's going to be fine. But the Saints, right, they're playing the Rams. It would be crazy to assume that the Saints have just been sort of like kind of I don't know. What do you want to do? You want to go watch a movie? I, I don't know if they're good. The Rams are good. Maybe, I hope. I mean, I, let's find out. And they're just showing up and let's just see how they, you know, they studied them, right? Like, you know, they've looked at their plays. They've studied the players. You know, they have been intensely digging in to find out who it is they're about to go into a game against. Why on earth would we not take this seriously to believe that there are the spiritual forces of wickedness? Not trying to scare you today, but I just want us to wake up because if we're really asking for awakening, if we're really asking for revival in this community, you better believe there are forces and there are snakes in our garden and we better pay attention to them. So to define this then, here's where I love to go. John chapter 10, verse 10. Now Jesus has this powerful verse. It's one of my favorite verses because it reminds me about this battle. It reminds me about what the snake in our garden wants to do. Look at what Jesus says in John 10, 10. He says, the enemy comes only to, say it, and, and, it's important to say these things out loud. It's important to read the word of God out loud. The enemy comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, what does the enemy want to take? You know, I think about, you know, if we're looking at the potholes and we're looking, okay, what's the, what's the fruit that's going to come from that? I go to the fruit of the Spirit. These are the very fruits that God wants to cultivate, the very things in our basket, in our lives that he wants to grow. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So later, I, I did this this morning. The Spirit, I, I'm still like, I never close the sermon up, and I'm always like, God, continue to write this if you've got more. And the Lord just led me to a sheet of paper. I'll post a picture of this later. And in the center, you can do this, this is homework, but write down the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, right there. And then draw a column on either side of it. And on the left side of it, this is what you do. Take John 10, 10, the first part, where Jesus says, the enemy comes only to steal and kill and destroy, and then draw an arrow over to the fruit of the Spirit. Because this is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to kill your peace. He wants to rob you of all of the very fruits that God is just so graciously wanting to pour into our lives. This is the role of the adversary, to cause dissension, to cause question, to cause unrest in your life. The serpent is working. You don't always see him, but listen, if you've got those things, shame and fear, and that's just the serpent just weaving and moving. But look at what Jesus wants to do. Sure, the enemy comes to lie, kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus, finish it. I have come so that they may have life and have it to the full. So where the enemy wants to take away, Jesus, praise the Lord, said, look, look, look. here's what I want to do in your life. I don't want to take anything away, but I want to add to. 
You think you've got love, I wanna give you more. You think you've got joy, I wanna give you more joy. You think you have peace in your life, I want peace to be so full to overflowing that people don't even know how you're getting this, where your source comes from, read John 4. That's what Jesus wants to do. So understand that the enemy wants to take these things away. First Peter chapter five, Peter says this powerful thing about the devil, and by the way, who could speak better about how the enemy wants you defined by your biggest mistake? Peter, the very one who Jesus said, Peter, by the end of the day, you're, you're gonna deny me three times. And Peter says, Lord, I, what? No, I would never do that, I would never. What happens? Three different times, Peter denies Jesus. But this is just how good God is. This is how gracious God is. Because on the other side of that, what happens? Jesus comes back and he sees Peter. They have breakfast together. And Jesus says to Peter, hey, do you love me? Lord, you, yes, I love you. Then, hey, Pete, just feed my sheep. Hey, Peter, do, do you love me? Lord, Lord, you know I love you. Like for every time that the enemy three times reminded Peter of how bad he was, how off the mark he was, Jesus replaced every one of those with that reminder that, Pete, I still love you. I'm not running away from you in the opposite direction like I'm here, and I want you to just keep going, lean in to me. Peter is the one who would say in 1 Peter 5 eight, be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion looking to devour someone in his path. So resist him and stand firm in the faith. Pete saying, Peter saying, dig your feet in, stand firm in the word of God and know not just who, but know whose you are. And of course, James, James chapter four, almost the same thing. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will draw near to you. So understand the enemy, understand the snake, how he works. How do you stand against it? Well, you gotta know the word of God. If ever there is a question that is bigger for our generation today than it ever has been is this, did God really say? Like, did God really say that this one little sin over here, like, did God really say that that is gonna lead you into a place that it's gonna destroy you? You gotta know what God says, and how do you know? You gotta be a people of his word. The more I find I put the word of God into me, then the next piece of that is this, you know the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to you. It's the promise, like we have the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our life. Why would we not invite the Holy Spirit to fight some of these battles? When shame, when regret, when regret these things start to come, why would we not invite the Holy Spirit in? Jesus says in John 14, he says, listen, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. This is what the Holy Spirit is gonna do. So know God's word. Lean into the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then lastly, I love to take people to Ephesians chapter six. We always need to remind ourselves of this. Put on the full armor of God. What a better time to set a reminder in your phone than 6 a.m. every morning, and what a better time to just open up and just read that. Put on the full armor of God, not just Sunday. Don't, don't settle for Sunday Christianity where you're serious about God one day, but the rest of the days, that snake is in the garden. Be intense about it. Like I love Paul says, look, pray on all occasions in Ephesians chapter six. There's never a moment that you wanna do this on your own because you need to lean in and let the power of God work in your life. Now that, that's all I wanna say about the snake, but you gotta understand there is a serpent. But here's the better part. It just keeps getting sweeter and better because you gotta claim the curse. Now, here's what I mean by that. I was having a conversation with someone, and they said, you know, the, the thing that's hard is just the fact that God would, that God would curse humanity, that, that like we would, we would have that, like, that goose egg on our forehead for forever, like we were cursed, but the reality is, get this, God didn't curse mankind. In fact, the only curse that you find in Genesis 3, get this, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. 
and you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all of the days of your life. He cursed the serpent. And then this part, Genesis 3.15, you, you will want to underline this. This was one of those when I was in seminary. Like Genesis 3.15 has been in front of me for a long time, but one of my biggest aha moments, I did not realize this. Do you know Genesis 3.15? One of my professors actually said, this is like the first gospel in the Bible. Now, wait, wait, what? Like the gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospels are all about Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done. How on earth can you find a gospel in Genesis 3.15? Just on the other side of God cursing the snake, look at what he says. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now get this, so good. What God is saying is he's saying that, okay, yes, Maybe, maybe Eve went off in a different direction. Okay, yes, maybe under this tree, Eve tasted the fruit, okay? But here's the thing. There will be another woman at some point in this story, and through her seed, she will give birth to someone, and this someone will Crush your head once and for all. Oh, you will strike at his heel, but through the power of this one who will come into the world will render you defeated. You see it? Under what, God bless you, under one tree in the Garden of Eden, Satan would attack, but get it, on another tree in Calvary, because of what Jesus Christ has done, the serpent would attack, but God defeated, crushing him under the heel. So why do we claim the curse? We claim the curse to be reminded that Satan has no stronghold on our lives. That when we get what Jesus Christ has done for us all, the goodness and the graciousness of our Father, then we know that when we recognize the serpent, when we see the snake in our garden, it just takes the name Jesus Christ to throw a foot down and to render him defeated. Can I get an amen? Come on, that's what I'm saying. That's the good news. That's what it means to claim the curse. And on the other side of claiming the curse, it just gets sweeter. Embrace the beauty of the covering. Have you ever, I'm wrapping up. Have you ever, um, ever made a joke and um, people didn't know you were joking? <laughs> I, I talk about um, anxiety and worry a lot. <laughs> And uh, I, it's creepy, I think my phone listens to me because sometimes I'll say things and I'll pull up Instagram and there's an ad that was just the very thing I was talking about. And last year, this ad pops up on my phone and it's this ad publicizing a weighted anxiety blanket that you can purchase. Have you heard of these? And I'm looking at it like you can get them. They're 20 pounders you can buy. And I'm looking at my wife and, you know, that ad would pop up. And I looked at my sweet bride and I was like, you know, my birthday's coming up. This 20-pound blanket would be awesome. And it would pop up again. I was like, you know, my birthday's. So it's my birthday, November 4th, last year. And on the tables, this beautiful bag with this tissue paper and one gift, man. And I walk over and open that up and I look inside it is a 20 pound weighted anxiety blanket. <laughs> and I look at my wife and she's like, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. She's like, are you excited? It's like, yeah. So it's that night, it's time to go to bed and my wife very sweetly looks at me and she says, do you, do you want your blankie? You're gonna put your, <laughs> oh, did I leave that on the table? Yeah, let me, let me go get that. And I, you know, <clears throat> lay that thing down. It's, just like a one-seater, it's just one size, and roll it out, and I'm thinking, what have I done? Y'all, let me tell you something. I climbed under that bad boy, I love it. <laughs> I did not, I was almost tempted to wear it today, it's cold out there. You know, we talk about like standing on the promises of God, and, and that's so necessary and good. But of all the things, I was thinking about that, that weighted anxiety blanket. And I was just thinking, God's like, you know, I want to do that for you in your life too. 
When the enemy wants to do all these things, distract you, remind you of who you were, what you've done, what you've been. I want you to be covered in who I am and who I see you as. See, we rush through Genesis 3 and we miss what I think is one of the most beautiful parts. And it's this moment where on the other side of God, looking at humanity, saying, where are you? Who told you these things? Who did you elevate above my voice? Do you know what God does? He takes the fig leaves that they used. Fig leaves, they're not going to hold. Some of you, you have real fig leaves in your life, and you're thinking that these temporary things, that's going to cover up the shame. For some of you, it's another glass of wine. For some of you, it's another website that's going to take you down the wrong direction. For some of you, it's another car, another Gucci bag. For some of you, there's all these things that we put on us, and we think, all right, that's going to take the pain away. But God looks at mankind. He looks at those fig leaves, and he goes, it's never going to hold. So let me cover you. Let me clothe you. I'm not done with your story. And he wraps them up. It's the prodigal son, the, the son who so wounds this relationship with his father. There's no way dad's ever taken me back. But what happens? The father sees him coming and he takes the robe. And he places the robe on him to say, you're not your shame. You're not your hurtful words. You're my child. There's beauty in this story. It's breathtaking. It's relentless. It's never ending. God's love is that real. So may you, in the midst of whatever goose egg on your forehead, pothole in your life, may you see that God is still growing beautiful things, that God is still tending his garden, that God is working in ways that we see it in ways that we don't. Let me pray for you today. Gracious God, I'm so thankful for the redemption found in this story that you've rendered the enemy defeated, that he holds no chains around us in our lives. So Holy Spirit, continue to remind us of that. The name Jesus is a powerful name. When we call on your name, the enemy flees in response. So in the name of Jesus Christ, cover your people, God. Remind us. Let us feel the weight of your goodness, the weight of your peace and your love and your joy. God, we want more of it and less of the adversary in our gardens. So God, thank you for that freedom person in this place right now. Their hearts open. They're ready to receive it. Invite them in. If you've never given your life to Jesus, just these words, Jesus, I invite you in. I profess you as Lord and Savior of my life. I, I don't even know how this works, but God, I know that I'm tired of fig leaves. I'm tired of flimsy things that disappoint me. And God, I'm ready for a Savior in my life. Say that prayer. Say it. Believe it and then celebrate it. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.